The disturbing and horrific murders that took place in the East End of London in the autumn of 1888 has been discussed, debated and speculated about for over a hundred years, becoming one of the most famous cases in British history. Although many suspects have emerged over the years, the police have never been able to solve the case, but professionals and amateurs alike have never given up trying to uncover the identity of the murderer and put an end to one of the grisliest mysteries in British true crime. So, it's not surprising that an author and part-time amateur sleuth named Russell Edwards attempted to solve this case once and for all after he purchased an artefact at an auction in 2007 that was said to have been owned by one of Jack the Ripper's victims. Hoping to uncover fresh evidence, he commissioned a renowned molecular biologist called Dr. Lou Helainen to conduct a forensic analysis of the supposedly well-preserved piece of cloth. Together, they would go on to make the bold claim to have unmasked the Ripper through the use of mitochondrial DNA analysis, and Russell Edwards later identified the Ripper as Aaron Kosminski in his book called Naming Jack the Ripper. But did they actually solve this infamous case using forensic science? Let's take a closer look. In the late 1800s, female prostitutes working and living in the slums of Whitechapel in London were the targets of a serial killer known at the time as Leather Apron and the Whitechapel murderer and who later became known by the infamous moniker of Jack the Ripper. Five women are known to have been brutally attacked, assaulted and mutilated by the killer. Although Scotland Yard had identified a further 11 disturbing murders in the Whitechapel and Spitalfields areas between 1888 and 1891 that may have been connected, these could not be definitively linked. The five known victims were all attacked at night under the cover of darkness and all were found in the same place that they had been murdered. These women were living in extreme poverty which had forced them into sex work and the killer took advantage of this. All of his victims suffered from unspeakable injuries including having their throats slashed and post-mortem disembowelment, fueling rumours of the killer possibly being a doctor or a butcher. In the late 1800s, police investigations worked quite differently to what we're familiar with today, and although there are some accusations of incompetence on behalf of the Metropolitan Police officers who attended the crime scenes, it seems they did the best that they could with what was available to them. Forensic tools were only just beginning to be developed at the time, in fact, the only person with a scientific background who would have attended the crime scenes would have been a doctor, and their interpretations would have been relatively limited. As police were only just starting to experiment with photography at the time of the Jack the Ripper murders, only one of the crime scenes were actually photographed. In the murder of Catherine Eddowes, the alleged owner of the scarf, the City of London Police were in charge of the investigation and created a detailed hand-drawn sketch of the crime scene, the position of her body and each of the injuries she had sustained instead of them being able to photograph the scene. Eyewitness testimony was a key tool that investigators relied upon, but as we know, it isn't the most reliable source of information, particularly when all the murders took place in the early hours of the morning in dark and dingy side streets and alleyways. The police investigated and arrested many suspects over the years, but they were never actually able to identify the monster who was responsible for these disturbing crimes. Over a hundred years later, is it even possible to still solve this case? And how do we know that after all this time that the scarf still contains useful information? The item bought at the auction was a silk screen printed shawl, the history of which is highly debated. In his book, Naming Jack the Ripper, Russell Edwards asserts the following. When Catherine Eddowes' murder scene was first discovered in the early hours of the 30th of September 1888, Acting Sergeant Amos Simpson allegedly took the eight-foot-long shawl home as a bizarre gift for his wife 
where it was then stored in a chest and handed down through their family for generations until being auctioned off in 2007. But this is where we encounter our first issue. Hallie Rubenhold, a historian and author of The Five, The Untold Lives of the Women Killed by Jack the Ripper, has said that there is no historical evidence, no documentation that links this shawl at all to Catherine Eddowes. Other historians have argued that acting Sergeant Amos Simpson was not even present at the murder scene of Miss Eddowes, as he worked for a different police force than that dealing with the murder. Witness statements taken from those who saw Catherine Eddowes in the hours leading up to her murder never once mentioned that she was wearing a shawl or scarf. In fact, it has been pointed out that the shawl was likely too expensive to have been owned by Catherine Eddowes, who was known to have been destitute and homeless. So, even if we make a huge leap and believe that this is the genuine scarf worn by Catherine Eddowes on the night of her brutal murder, there is no way to know for certain if this item was stored securely in a way that would have preserved any biological fluid that may have been on it. In fact, it's almost certain that the scarf would be contaminated. And given how important contamination of evidence is, how reliable could the results of any forensic analysis really be? Russell Edwards did not go into much detail about this in his book, and it was years later before any scientific evidence of his claims were made public. In 2019, a report was published in the Journal of Forensic Sciences detailing new molecular analysis that had been conducted on the last remaining piece of physical evidence relating to the Jack the Ripper case. Dr Yari Luhleinen, a senior lecturer of molecular biology at Liverpool John Moores University, and co-researcher David Miller, a sperm and reproduction expert at the University of Leeds, were the ones that conducted the analysis and research. The scarf was subjected to infrared imagery and spectrophotometry testing. The stains were inspected with a microscope and viewed under ultraviolet light, with one mark identified as a potential semen stain. The journal article attempted to provide scientific evidence of their claim that they had identified genetic material from the scarf that matched living descendants of both the victim and the suspect that they had named, a Mr. Aaron Kosminski. This sounds convincing enough. Well, if you look a bit closer, the cracks really begin to show. First, the authors of the article claim to have identified mitochondrial DNA from the suspect, but is this even possible? In a normal DNA test, the DNA is taken from the nucleus of the cell, which would contain the individual's entire DNA sequence in a linear pattern. Mitochondrial DNA, on the other hand, is found in the small round chromosome located in the mitochondria and is only passed on from a mother to her offspring, generating a much shorter DNA sequence. Mitochondrial DNA can be useful for forensic scientists because there are often many more copies available in a cell compared to nuclear DNA. But because it only contains the genetic information relating to the individual's mother, this form of DNA is not able to be used to identify and implicate specific people or suspects, and instead is used by investigators as a tool to exclude contributors to a genetic sample. In other words, this type of DNA testing would not have been able to produce a match to Aaron Kosminski's DNA. Second, the mitochondrial DNA was collected from what the researchers assumed was a semen stain. But this completely ignores the fact that there was never any evidence at any of the Jack the Ripper crime scenes to suggest any explicitly sexual component to the murders. Jack the Ripper was a depraved and sadistic individual, and while there were definite sexual elements to his crimes, he did not sexually assault his victims. In fact, the medical examiner that attended the crime scene of Catherine Eddowes stated that there was, quote, no trace of any recent sexual connection. So, I think it's safe to assume that whatever stains were on the scarf likely had nothing to do with Jack the Ripper. 
The authors of the journal article were vague on their methodology and analysis, a key issue when discussing literally any kind of science. They failed to mention how the descendants were related to Catherine Eddowes and Aaron Kosminski. The researchers also claimed to have identified the entire mitochondrial DNA genome, whereas they actually only looked at a few mitochondrial DNA segments, which could be similar in large segments of the population. This makes it impossible for fellow scientists to assess or replicate their results, which in the scientific community is a fairly basic error. In the journal article, the researchers failed to acknowledge that the name Kosminski was only ever mentioned in one document from the time of the murders, and the information about this individual was incredibly limited, stating only that he was a Polish Jew living in Whitechapel with a great hatred of women, particularly prostitutes and sex workers, and is noted to have had homicidal tendencies. There is no other information available, not his first name, no physical description, no known address or family connections. In fact, it was only in 1987 that it was confirmed that there was even a man matching that name living in the area, who ended up being held indefinitely in the Colney Hatch Asylum a few years after the murders. But the name Kosminski was, at the time, likely not that uncommon in Whitechapel, an area with a large influx of Eastern European immigrants. While it is noted that Aaron Kosminski was eventually admitted to the mental asylum for threatening his sister with a knife, this is the only aggressive or violent incident logged in his history. While at the asylum, he was actually described as harmless and, most interestingly, preferred to speak his native language of Yiddish and did not have a great grasp of English. Since Jack the Ripper was able to converse and charm his victims, enough for them to join him in dark alleyways, it's questionable whether Aaron Kosminski would have had the language skills to do this. Overall, there is very little information available about Aaron Kosminski, and even less that links him to the Jack the Ripper murders. It's likely that we will never be able to conclusively solve the case, even with the help of forensic science.